Okay, folks, if you give me your attention, uh, we will get started with this evening's program. So welcome to Cantini. It's uh, great to see you all here. Uh, my name is Paul Herbert. I'm the director of the First Division Museum. And uh, we're, I, it's my pleasure to welcome you to uh, the first session of our National Defense Forum that we're doing this year uh, because it's a presidential election year. Uh, first of all, of course, you're on the historic estate of late Colonel Robert R. McCormick, uh, and who named this estate Cantini after a little village in France where America fought its first battle in World War I and its first battle for Europe, and we're still in Europe. Um, the colonel was there. He commanded the 1st Battalion, 5th Field Artillery of the 1st Division, was devoted to soldiers and veterans and his fir beloved 1st Division for the rest of his life, uh, passed away on this estate, is buried on this estate, and so a, uh, an important part of his legacy is his military service and his devotion to veterans, and that's why there's a 1st Division Museum uh, here on Cantini. Uh, another thing about Colonel McCormick is that he was, uh, he was very politically engaged. Uh, he was a journalist. Uh, he uh, believed in education. He believed in the power of the press. He believed in First Amendment freedoms. And so it's sort of in, in that vein that we're doing what we're doing this evening. Uh, this is the first of three programs. This idea, in fact, was J.D. Comas's. J.D., raise your hand. He's back there. He's our director of programming and education. And he came up with the idea of partnering with the Foreign Policy Research Institute of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and the Union League Club of Chicago to put on a series of what we're calling national defense forums. So, and each one of these, the public is invited, and we give them on the first evening at the Union League Club down in Chicago, and we did last night on this same topic, and then we bring the same speakers out here to talk to a suburban um, audience. And the next such session will be here on July 29th, the first session at July 28th at the Union League Club, second session out here on July 29th. Um, and then there'll be another one later in the year at a date to be determined. Uh, our next session, we'll talk, this session, we're going to talk about ISIS and its threat, uh, the degree to which it's a threat to the national security interests of the United States. Our next session, we'll talk about uh, civil, democratic civil military relations and the American military and American politics. In our last session, we're going to uh, assess the national security and defense platforms of both of the major parties uh, that are contending in the presidential election. And we do that without any political agenda, but just to inform you, the public, and the voters, uh, so that as you think about who should be our next president or next commander in chief and all the other issues in the election, uh, you'll have this information to, to help you in that regard. So we think that's very much in the tradition of uh, Colonel McCormick, and that if he isn't here personally, certainly he is with us in spirit. So uh, the Union League Club of Chicago, tremendous partner. Uh, we had a great session down there last night, very engaged. Um, the Foreign Policy Research Institute of Philadelphia uh, is, has been our partner since 2007. Every year we hold a national teachers conference here at the First Division Museum. They do all the heavy lifting, but we provide the place and the agenda and we contribute in other ways. And we bring 44 high school history teachers from all over the United States and we spend a weekend workshop with them on military history so that issues of our military and military affairs and military history can be integrated into the history that they're teaching in secondary schools. And they are terrific teachers and it's a terrifically successful program. And all the material from that program, if you have an interest in it, going back to 2007 is online uh, at the uh, website of the Foreign Policy Research Institute and it is a wealth of information on American military history. So our speakers tonight, we are delighted to have here, uh, but my colleague Michael Noonan is from the Foreign Policy Research Institute, and he's going to come up uh, after, I, if I ever give up the mic, uh, and um, uh, tell you a little bit about FPRI, and then he's going to introduce our speakers uh, who 
uh, are here uh, at the invitation of FPRI because they both have an association with that wonderful institution. Finally, the, I think you all know that the weather forecast is fairly dire. You're, you're in here now, so don't you dare leave early. We're going to get through the whole Q&A, right? The whole presentation in Q&A. You're committed. But should our security office call us and say that we have a severe storm or tornado headed toward Cantini, we hope that doesn't happen, uh, JD and I and some of our other staff are going to help you all move down the hall that way and into our very secure basement because it would not be wise to remain in this room full of glass walls <laughs> in the middle of a heavy storm. Now, we can't compel you to go there. You can make a run for your car if you want. I mean, that's on you, but uh, we do have a plan and we do have a safe place for us all to go. And you might want to join us because that's where we store the booze for the bar. And, you know, who knows how long we'll be down there. So um, anyway, um, but we'll, we'll assume that that's not going to happen. So without further ado, thank you very much for coming. Welcome, uh, and please welcome Michael Noonan of the Foreign Policy Research Institute and, oh, by the way, a U.S. Army veteran of Operation Iraqi Freedom. Michael. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for coming out tonight, especially with the weather, but also coming out here, I think, shows the interest and uh, the importance of civic literacy, uh, particularly as we head into an election year. As Paul said, uh, we are not trying to show any political, political angle in this series. It's mainly just for educational purposes. Uh, I want to thank the First Division Museum for having us here. Uh, we have, FPRI has many partners, but I have to say that First Division Museum is definitely at the top of our list in terms of partners. The excellent work that Paul and his staff do and JD do, uh, they're just first-rate, outstanding partners. Uh, and I'm not just saying that because I'm here. Uh, I really, truly uh, feel that way. So let me tell you a little bit about FPRI before I announce the speakers or present the speakers to you. Uh, FPRI was founded at the University of Pennsylvania in 1955 uh, by Ambassador Robert Str the late Ambassador Robert strauss -Hupé. And the reason why the Institute was founded was, in a sense, to try to democratize American foreign and defense policy. At the time, kind of the councils or the, the feeder places for the elites that devised American foreign and defense policy came from very small pools, and FPRI uh, was an attempt to try to expand that, and we've been doing so since 1955. We are a, a nonprofit organization. Uh, we became independent in 1970. Uh, we, our touchstone is sort of a geopolitical approach to international affairs where we focus on history, culture, uh, and geography, and politics as kind of our lenses of examining foreign affairs. We have scholars ranging from center left to center right. Um, and that's a, if you want to learn any more information about us, just go on the web at www.fpri.org. Okay, end of commercial. I am very proud to present uh, our speakers for tonight. I think you're in for a, a rare treat. To, uh, uh, there are a lot of experts out in punditry, but I think uh, we have delivered the real deal for you. Barack Mendelssohn to my left, to your right, not a political statement, and next to him is uh, Cole Bunzel. Barack Mendelssohn is Associate Professor of Political Science at Haverford College outside Philadelphia. He also happens to be a Senior Fellow of the Foreign Policy Research Institute. Uh, he is an expert on uh, jihadi studies. If you, uh, he's not from New Jersey. Uh, his accent is actually Israeli. He served in the IDF for five years uh, before he went on, did graduate studies. He has a PhD from Cornell University. Um, and his latest book is the Al-Qaeda Franchise, Oxford University Press 2016. I'm sure he'd be happy if you bought it, but that's not in order. Next name is Cole Bunzel. Cole Bunzel, I think, is one of, uh, at the top of a new cadre of sort of younger scholars. Uh, I would put him definitely in the top five, and probably higher than that, in, in that order of people kind of under 30. Uh, fluent Arabic speaker. He spent two years in uh, Syria uh, doing some immersion uh, training back in 2008-2009. He's a PhD candidate at Princeton University. 
Uh, his doctoral dissertation deals with the early movement of the Wahhabist movement in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and uh, he's done a lot of policy, uh, policy writing as well for Brookings and other places, and was profiled in uh, a big piece uh, that uh, Graham Wood published in The Atlantic, uh, if you recognize his name. So without further ado, they're each going to have about 20 minutes, and then we'll open it up to Q&A. Thank you very much. Cole. Well, thanks for everyone coming here, and thanks especially to Paul and JD and Mike. And thanks for the introduction, Mike, though I have to say I'm actually 30. I can't claim to be younger than 30, unfortunately. It's, I'd also like to say it's a privilege to be here with, with Barack. Barack is a very distinguished um, professor of, of these matters, and there was one distinction that Mike didn't mention, and that is that he has been uh, mentioned by name in the English language magazine of ISIS, or the Islamic State. And it used to be that the great privilege of the counterterrorism scholars was to be cited by uh, bin Laden or Zawahiri in an al-Qaeda statement. But today, uh, the touchstone is really uh, that distinction. So um, just bear that in mind. Um, before I begin, and mostly what I'll be providing or try to provide is a, an overview of the, um, the organizational and the ideological history of the Islamic State. And I'll explain why I tend to call it the Islamic State as opposed to, to ISIS. But I thought I might give uh, some sense of how it is I get my information. As Mike was alluding to, um, I am w probably a member of a small group of, of relatively younger people um, that has been given the title, actually, of the Jihadi Hunters. There is a, uh, an article in the Boston, Boston Globe by a journalist named uh, Thanasis Cambanis from a couple years ago that described this um, kind of self-made group of younger Arabic-speaking scholars that spends a great deal of their time, way too much time, uh, to be sane, on the internet going through Jihadi material and who are often the first to be aware of important developments happening in w with these movements. Um, he also said in an interview he gave about the article that a sane and balanced person wouldn't do this. So uh, that that is a warning. Um, to give an example of th these kinds of, um, just the kinds of things that uh, I, I've, I've looked at to, to get these sources, I'll give you an example from, from April 2013. This was the, um, the month that the Islamic State of Iraq uh, announced its expansion into Syria, thereby becoming the Islamic State of Iraq and Sham, or Greater Syria. And I was doing my routine uh, late at night looking at jihadi web forums, one of the, the uh, official or semi-official Al-Qaeda forums, which is a password-protected thing, and I'm a member with a password. Uh, and there appeared all of a sudden a statement by the leader of what was then called the Islamic State of Iraq. A little context was provided. There was no transcript. I listened to this about 15 minute long speech. He said a lot of really interesting things. I wrote an article on my blog. Uh, I called it Introducing the Islamic State of Iraq and Greater Syria. Uh, I thought that maybe ISIGs would take off, not ISIS. Apparently I got that wrong. But it did turn out to be the first article on, on ISIS. Um, so that's kind of um, just an example of how uh, I've gotten a lot of information. Uh, today, we don't really use these forums anymore. Twitter has completely taken the place uh, of these web forums. And even more recently, you have a, I think it's based out of Russia, a program called Telegram, which I use on my phone to get all of this uh, information. But the history of the Islamic State goes back farther than 2013. If you want to look at the organizational history of this movement, you have to go back actually to 2006. Uh, few people know that the Islamic State as the entity as it is conceived of today was actually founded not in 2013, but in October 2006 um, as the Islamic State of Iraq. That was actually uh, 10 years ago exactly, or not to the day, but it was 10 years ago in Ramadan according to the Islamic calendar. So it is a 10-year-old organization. It's helpful uh, to think of it in that way, and I'll, and I'll explain why as, as I go on. Then the, the organization that this Islamic State of Iraq came out of was Al-Qaeda in Iraq, a group that had been founded and led by a man named Abu Musab Zarqawi. He was a Jordanian. He was not, um, earlier, he was not 
affiliated with Al-Qaeda. He took money from Al-Qaeda, but he had issues with Al-Qaeda. He thought Al-Qaeda was too moderate. He had his own training camp in Afghanistan in the north in a city called Herat. Um, and he moved after the invasion of Afghanistan in 2001. He, he, uh, he took refuge in Iran where he had a conversation with an Al-Qaeda leader about establishing a state in Iraq. Hopefully, he was anticipating an American invasion at the time, about it, establishing a state in Iraq that could possibly turn into a, a caliphate that would go on to do what it has done today and expand into uh, neighboring territories. Uh, few people paid attention to that at the time, and few people noticed that the Islamic State of Iraq, when it was, when it uh, founded itself and declared itself, that it did have these, these, this kind of ambition to be something bigger than it was, and it had uh, somewhat of an ambiguous relationship with Al Qaeda. It, it had affiliated with Al Qaeda and the, and the and Al Qaeda in Iraq, but it had said that it is no longer Al Qaeda, but it was still deferential to Al Qaeda. Anyway, it was ambiguous enough that after the death of Osama bin Laden, it was able to distance itself from Al Qaeda and basically go rogue, as it were. Um, so in 2006, Sarkawi had died just shortly before the founding of the Islamic State of Iraq. And when that state was founded, it was not a smashing success. It was actually very much a failure as a state building project. This was 2006, the time of the surge. It was the time of the awakening councils where the Sunni tribes in Ambar province in particular were being won over to the Baghdad government. And the Islamic State of Iraq was denounced uh, by fellow jihadis. Why are we calling this a state? This is a joke. This is a paper state. People actually use the term paper state and it caught on. And that's why I, in the, the title of my Brookings piece that Mike mentioned, I call it From Paper State to Caliphate. And um, you'll see that today some people are anticipating that it could go back to paper status. But um, for a long time, the Islamic State would argue that we're not a paper state, just you wait, we'll, we'll actually be there. Um, that didn't happen uh, under the leadership of the first two leaders. The first two leaders um, were an Iraqi and an Egyptian man. Uh, the first, his name was Abu Omar al-Baghdadi, different from the current Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi that we have today. And the second leader was an Egyptian named Abu Ayyub al-Masri, who was an al-Qaeda veteran who had spent a lot of time in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Those two men were killed in uh, an airstrike in 2010. And shortly after that, in May 2010, the current leader of this group, the Islamic State of Iraq, was elected, and that was that's Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. Baghdadi was um, perhaps as a strategic leader not any better than these others, but he did have, uh, he commanded uh, a certain legitimacy by virtue of the fact that he had studied uh, to the degree of, of a doctorate in Islamic studies in Baghdad. And his dissertation, which unfortunately has been uh, wiped off the face of the planet was actually on, on a, an obscure text on the correct pronunciation of the Quran. So he has a little cachet as a Islamic scholar. Um, he gives his first statement in May 2011 uh, commemorating the death of Osama bin Laden, but he is not really on the radar much until 2012. In 2012, the Islamic State of Iraq starts to give a number of speeches saying that, look, we're coming back, get ready, get prepared. This is also the time when the United States is saying, look, we're done in Iraq, we're finished, we're leaving, everything is going great. Um, well, according to the Islamic State, they had the narrative correct. Uh, 2011 was also important for another reason, and that was because the Islamic State of Iraq, as it was conceived then, sent a contingent of its soldiers into Syria to lead a new group there that would be called Jebhat al-Nusra, or the Nusra Front. And you'll read about that today in, in the newspaper as the Al-Qaeda wing in Syria, which it is today. But originally, it was nothing more than a front group for the Islamic State of Iraq. And this is where I come back to the, the episode that I mentioned at the beginning, where I was sitting in my chair looking at the jihadi forums. The Islamic State of Iraq had announced that it was expanding into Syria to become the Islamic State of Iraq and Sham, or Greater Syria, and Jebhat al-Nusra was no longer to be. It was going to be dissolved, but Jebhat al-Nusra had different plans. The leader of that group decided that, no, we're actually going to uh, 
if we're going to be loyal to Al-Qaeda, we're not going to follow this man, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. So there you have the kind of the beginning of the division between Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State in Syria today, which is, is very important and I would expect is going to be with us. Maybe Barack has a different take. I think it's going to be with us for a very, very long time. But if you really want to understand this rift between Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State, I think it's also important to take a look at the uh, ideological underpinnings of this group, of these two groups, because they share essentially the same ideology, but they have different emphases. So both of these groups belong to a current of Islam that is called, and they use this term, it's called Jihadi Salafism, or a Salafiyya al jihadiyya It is a, a group, um, I mean, this is a movement that has scholars in various countries across the Arab Middle East, um, that has um, reference points that are, are very uh, specific. It is rooted in, a, in deeper currents of thought. Essentially, it grows in the 1980s and 1990s, and Al-Qaeda is, is the move is the, the organization that is at the forefront of, uh, of this movement. Um, but it is, it is the confluence of two streams of thought, jihadi Salafism. The first stream can be thought of as an Egyptian stream, and the second stream can be thought of as a Saudi stream. And the Egyptian stream is the one to which, which Al-Qaeda is closer. So this is a stream of thought that comes out of the Muslim Brotherhood and revolutionary thought associated with Sayyid Qutb. There are some socialist uh, influences here. It's very interested in seizing power and in, in revolution against the state. It did have the idea of founding a caliphate. The other stream of thought from Saudi Arabia is called Salafi. It's essentially less about power and more about the purity of doctrine. You can think of it as a purist movement. It's very intolerant of other kinds of Islam particularly Shiism. It, it sees the Shia as not true Muslims, but people who are heretics and need to be killed. And need, who need to be killed, yes, it's funny, but they do this. Uh, they need to be killed before you and I need to be killed. They hate the Shia more than you and me. And that's an important point. And these strands are in competition for a long time within the jihadi Salafi movement, and they, and they still are. There were people back in the 1990s who would complain that the Salafis are getting too much influence, and we need to stop having these doctrinaire people leading us. Um, Al-Qaeda, though, would generally um, would try to stick closer to the Egyptian stream of thought. It was less purist, and this is why somebody like, uh, like a Zarqawi couldn't really closely associate with somebody like a bin Laden. A bin Laden didn't talk about the Shia very much. He was not interested in killing Shia. He was interested in, in gaining popular support. Um, his mantra was that we need to attack the far enemy, that is the regimes in the West or the United States that are keeping down the Arabs and the Muslims and not attack the near enemy first, the near enemy being the regimes such as in Egypt and Saudi Arabia, these oppressive governments that he believed were truly just puppets of, of the United States. Um, so he believed that by attacking the far enemy, he could gain more popular support and eventually, gradually, gain enough uh, momentum and power and become something like the caliphate. Uh, but he didn't have an understanding of the caliphate as something that, would about, uh, that was about to appear. This is another difference between Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State. The Islamic State also, because of its more uh, Salafi influence, not really concerned with popular support. It actually derides the term popular support in Arabic. It says that it has no interest in popular support. It's going to win support by killing people. Uh, it hates the Shia. It wants to kill the Shia. It says that Al-Qaeda is soft on the Shia and uh, that it's not going to, to be like them. And it's more focused on the near enemy, that is the regimes uh, in in the Middle East, and it's less focused, and though it might be hard to understand at the moment because the Islamic State is carrying out attacks against the West, but originally it was much less interested in attacking us than it was in attacking the regimes in the Middle East, particularly uh, the one in Iraq and Syria. Now, so I've tried to explain that this, this dispute between Al-Qaeda and ISIS it runs deep, and you can see it running already in the period before the Islamic State of Iraq is founded in 2006, Zarqawi, who was leading Al-Qaeda in Iraq, 
from 2004, I believe, until 2006, he had a lot of disputes with Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda told him to stop killing the Shia, and he said, no, we're going to keep killing the Shia. So essentially, you had this, this rift there, and beginning in 2013, a rift that had been sort of below the surface emerged and became visible to everyone, and you saw this division between the in the jihadi world between Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State. Um, now, to bring the story up to the present, we know that it was in Ju June 2014 that the Islamic State moves from Syria back into Iraq. It conquers a significant amount of territory. It declares the caliphate in June 2014 in, in Ramadan two years ago. And uh, thereafter, the United States begins a campaign, an aerial campaign, to stop its expansion, particularly its expansion in the north. That's where we first started to try to prevent the Islamic State's advance against our Kurdish allies. And it was shortly after that, that in September 2014, that the speaker, the official speaker of the Islamic State, a Syrian man, his name is Abu Muhammad al-Adnani, he gave a speech calling for revenge attacks against the West. So these were to be lone wolf attacks. This is the origin of the Islamic State lone wolf attack. He said that while it is incumbent on Muslims to migrate to the Islamic State, that if you cannot migrate, then the next best thing you, should do, you can do is to attack people in the West. And to do that uh, is a form of retaliation for the bombing that is going on currently. And this is called, in jihadi parlance, paying the price. So you'll see this as recently as the Omar Mateen uh, killing spree. You'll see that all the jihadi media that follow this consider this to be paying the price. And they, they frame it in terms of, of retaliation, which is different from Al-Qaeda's, the kind of terrorism that Al-Qaeda was waging against the West, because Al-Qaeda was focused on this. Yes, it's paying the price, but it seemed that it deemed it to be a necessary condition for acquiring territory. And the Islamic State is doing it after acquiring our territory. So you might see the one silver lining in a group like the Islamic State is that if you don't um, attack it, it might not attack you first. The problem is that if we don't do anything to prevent this expansion, then this is a group that could balloon, it could grow in popularity across the Muslim world, and eventually you'd have a much, much, much bigger problem. So essentially, I see our current strategic issues uh, facing the Islamic State is a kind of dilemma between if we do if we do nothing, yes, they might not be attacking us tomorrow, but they could be a much much bigger threat in the future, which is um, kind of a perhaps not a very reassuring way of looking at it. But I think that that's basically how it has to be looked at. Um, now I'll end with just one other thing, which is that the Islamic State recently has been discussing its future in some of its publications and in its speeches, and its future outlook is somewhat bleak. Recently, it has lost a good amount of territory, particularly in Iraq, and it has basically said to the United States in these, in these speeches that, look, you can kill us and you can take away our territory, but even if you do that, we're just going to go back to the way that things were between 2006 and 2013. We're going to retreat into the desert, and we'll, we'll, out, we'll outweight you, and we will be back. And they didn't use the term, but one could surmise that they could think of themselves as a kind of paper caliphate, where they will not really exist in territory, in territorial terms, but they will exist as, a, as an entity. And that is one possibility. So as we look to the future, we, I think it's important to remember that this is a challenge that is probably going to uh, outlast a great number of us. Thanks. Good evening. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I want to thank our host here. Uh, and I want to thank Cole. It's, a, it's the first time that I'm actually, uh, that I got a chance to meet Cole. I've been following his work. He's really uh, an exceptional scholar. I'm not going to say exceptional young scholar. He's just exceptional. Uh, yes, he's young too. That's true. Uh, one thing that as a good 
polite American call didn't mention when he uh, noted my, the reference to uh, my work in the Islamic State's magazine in English was that before they started citing some of my work, they called me the Jew Barack Mendelssohn, uh, which it's really interesting how uh, the, the kind of validation that people in the academia get. So uh, it was a big uh, success, and I found it funny. Uh, what I'm going to argue in the uh, time that I have, a uh, couple of main things. Uh, first is that I will try to argue that the Islamic State is weakening. I will uh, explain that primarily as a combination of uh, strategic miscalculations of the Islamic State, uh, and I will argue that uh, one of the main weaknesses uh, of its plan was the lack of a viable economic plan for its caliphate. But notwithstanding these uh, positive trends, uh, I will have to uh, um, also end with a very uh, dire warning that the threat is still very significant and is not going away anytime soon. So let me start by speaking a little bit about the strategy. I'm not going to say more, too much about the strategy since uh, Cole covered some of those aspects, but it's important to uh, start by emphasizing the uh, differences between Al-Qaeda and the uh, Islamic State. Uh, for Al-Qaeda, the vision was that they looked at the past and they said the experience that we have with all the efforts to change regimes in the Middle East was that we never succeeded. And bin Laden tried to figure out the reason, how come we didn't succeed. And bin Laden said uh, the reason why we couldn't succeed was that the US was standing behind those regimes. So every time that we were close to success, the United States uh, came in to support uh, the tyrants of the Middle Eastern countries. Uh, and the result was a failure. So if that's the case, then he said the answer should be to go after the United States, to go after the far enemy. Only if we manage to cripple the far enemy, we will be able to bring about change in the Middle East. Now, it's not surprising that he had that kind of thought and that he believed that it is actually feasible. Uh, he is the product of the 1980s war in Afghanistan, and this is exactly the way that he saw the outcome of the war between the Soviets and the Mujahideen in Afghanistan. And since uh, he saw what happened to the Soviet Union after that, and his mind, in his mind, uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union is actually the result of the war in Afghanistan, then he says, by extension, uh, same thing can happen with the United States, the same way that uh, the battle against the Soviets led to the collapse of the Soviet Union, which released all the countries that the Soviet Union had control over. And then the same thing can happen uh, with the United States and the countries, the regimes of the Middle East. The Islamic State has a different perspective. The Islamic State focuses on the near enemy. And one of the main reasons for that, Cole mentioned the uh, particular hatred uh, to the Shia. Uh, of course, there's also the geostrategic element, uh, the identification of the Shia uh, with Iran. So it's, uh, it's really hard to separate ideology uh, from uh, ideology from strategy. The understanding of the uh, Islamic State of the threat is uh, definitely influenced by events in the region, and the Islamic State being in uh, Iraq or emerging from Iraq definitely saw the influence of Iran in a much more significant way than uh, jihadis in other locations. But there are other reasons why the Islamic State went for a different uh, strategy. Uh, and I think that the main ones are that uh, they just, uh, the time in which they managed to uh, reemerge uh, was time of significant, is still time of significant changes in the Middle East. 
So they look at the situation and you have the Arab revolutions and those revolutions create vacuum in the region. It's not just vacuum because the old regimes collapse, it also creates opportunities, lots of weapons that are becoming available um, in a strong sense that now is the time to actually bring about change. And to some extent it makes sense that uh, you can have a strategic plan and try to uh, focus on a certain enemy, but the situation on the ground suddenly created opportunities and you cannot just uh, uh, not take those opportunities because somebody else is going to fill the vacuum. So the Arab Revolution was one element. The other element was the uh, US policy under the Obama administration, and the Islamic State read it uh, very clearly, uh, as suggesting that the United States is really eager to depart from the Middle East. So from the Islamic State's perspective, uh, it was a very reasonable gamble uh, to try to take action in Iraq or in general to take action in the Middle East and try to uh, expand and fight against the near enemy, uh, believing that the United States is not going to stand behind uh, regimes in the Middle East or will not try to uh, make any significant effort in order to repel the Islamic State and prevent its uh, expansion. The Islamic State is characterized by uh, tendency for bold, very risky moves. Two main ones or two main features that uh, the focus on operational expansion uh, in which the Islamic State uh, tried to push as far as it could uh, on multiple fronts at the same time. And the second is the establishment of the caliphate. Now, in my opinion, the Islamic State was overly ambitious. The Islamic State tried to do military expansion and state building, the building of the caliphate at the same time. Now, it's very likely that they looked at the history of uh, um, the Ummah, of the uh, Muslim community under Muhammad and after him his uh, successors, and uh, saw that um, Muhammad's successors managed to both expand and build an empire at the same time. And since they are very attached to the, uh, uh, to, to the experience and to the example of uh, the prophet and his companions, uh, that might have been a reasonable, uh, a reasonable trajectory for them. But in reality, this uh, put significant constraint. It's really hard to do both things at the same time. And I think this is one of the important reasons why uh, their efforts are failing uh, right now. When you do military expansion, uh, you produce new enemies. And the Islamic State was not very careful in picking uh, uh, comfortable enemies. At the beginning, it did have some comfortable enemies. Uh, the Iraqi military collapsed pretty, uh, pretty quickly to the point that uh, the uh, Shia community in Iraq uh, had to mobilize and create militias because the military was not able to function and there was a significant fear about what's going to happen to Baghdad. But once the... Um, and then the uh, Islamic State managed to uh, advance also against uh, uh, some Kurdish outposts in areas that are far from the uh, mountains where the Kurds are much stronger and better in fighting. And of course, there were lots of minorities on the way. So at first, the Islamic State had significant success because the f enemies that it fought were relatively weak. Uh, the enemies that it fought in Syria it didn't really fight uh, uh, Assad's forces. Um, on occasion it did, but overall the main expansion of the Islamic State in Syria was at the expense of other Sunni rebel groups. But at a certain point uh, came the stronger enemies, and the Islamic State managed to anger too many actors at the same time, and some of them too powerful, 
uh, whether it's direct uh, intervention through bombing like the United States and its allies or Russia, uh, or through provision of weapons, advanced weapons to uh, US allies in the region that allowed them uh, to prepare Islamic State's uh, uh, attacks, uh, making expansion a lot more difficult. I think that provoking that the Islamic State made a significant mistake by provoking the United States to intervene too early. Uh, the first event that led to that was the flight of the uh, of the Yazidis uh, on Mount Sinjar. Uh, but the United States was really trying to do as little as possible, uh, trying still not to intervene too much. But the Islamic State, uh, perhaps because of hubris, because of uh, perhaps miscalculations, uh, perhaps they thought that they're going to win either way, uh, moved on and tried to retaliate by uh, beheading the hostages that it had, uh, the American hostages. And the result was that uh, it managed to bring the United States into the region. Uh, the United States was very reluctant, but even a reluctant United States is still a very powerful country, and uh, the U.S. bombs are not something that I, I would not want to be exposed to uh, an American bombing. Uh, so in this regard, the, the, the Islamic State, I think, went too far, too fast, and uh, that's the beginning of its weakening. What about the move of the establishment of the caliphate? The number of reasons that I, I think that led the Islamic State to establish the caliphate. Uh, the first is to try to elevate the position of the Islamic State. Uh, everybody else are organizations. The Islamic State is now, it's not even a, an emirate, which is a, a much more constrained, limited, geographically uh, Islamic entity. They went for a caliphate, and a caliphate is really the uh, restoration of uh, uh, a utopian order uh, that uh, comes with significant implications. I'll mention them uh, in a second. So the establishing the caliphate was supposed to elevate uh, the uh, stature of the Islamic State. Uh, another thing it was supposed to do was to stifle debate. Because once you establish the caliphate and uh, uh, declare Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi as uh, the caliph, uh, then as a caliph, he has authority over, or at least in his own eyes, over Muslims anywhere. All Muslims, wherever they are. Now, when you have authority over somebody, any kind of dissent, unless you committed a grave sin, any kind of dissent is a rebellion against authority. So by elevating his position as the caliph, this is an effort to stifle debate, prevent people that otherwise uh, would have been in roughly similar uh, position uh, and could really argue with him. But since he positions himself as the caliph, uh, debate is considered rebellion. Very closely linked to that is that by establishing a caliphate, uh, the Islamic State was hoping to attract other jihadi groups to join it. As opposed to Al-Qaeda that was just talking, here we are, the Islamic State, we're actually delivering. And that was supposed to be very attractive uh, for other jihadi groups. But that attraction didn't work as well as the Islamic State uh, thought at first. Uh, it took them lots of time to get uh, um, allegiance of uh, different uh, jihadi groups, and usually those were not really significant uh, jihadi groups, at least not, not at first. Uh, but it wasn't just about uh, attracting jihadi groups, it was also about forcing uh, uh, jihadi groups, because again, the same principle, once you announce a caliphate, you have authority over everybody, and the claim of the Islamic State was then that all jihadi groups are nullified, they need to disband 
and to join the uh, armies of the, of the caliph. Another reason for the establishment of the caliphate is mobilization of individuals that are not necessarily affiliated with those jihadi groups. That was one of the main problems of the uh, Al-Qaeda's strategy uh, when it attacked on 9-11, that it didn't really have any reasonable plan for how you move from attacking the United States to actually mobilizing forces that can then face the United States. The Islamic State thought that they have a solution. Again, relying on the authority of the caliph, now the caliph can come and indeed in his first khutbah uh, as the uh, caliph, two years ago, the beginning of Ramadan, he is very explicit calling on Muslims from all over the world to come and immigrate to the caliphate. Besides the fact that this is a, a, a religious, uh, um, a religious obligation and that it follows the example of the prophet that immigrated from Mecca to Medina to establish uh, uh, Islamic life. Uh, this is also something that was very necessary for the Islamic State because it's doing a state building project and the Islamic State for that needs professionals. So this is not just attracting foreign fighters, people that will fight for you, even though you really need those because now as a state, you're moving towards a more traditional conventional warfare, which means you need much, uh, many more, uh, um, many more uh, individuals to fight. Uh, but he used that khutbah to call on professionals to join, because he needs, uh, he needs engineers, he needs uh, uh, people that can actually deliver services as a, a state. Uh, and since many of the, the services in the area uh, were pretty poor, lots of professionals left because of the Islamic State brutality, and because he wanted, bringing foreigners is not just to provide these kind of services. If you try to imagine a caliphate as a completely new kind of order that transcends nationality, then you need to bring new people that will dilute the uh, Iraqi and Syrian national identity of the people living under the caliphate. And finally, the last reason that uh, he called uh, uh, that they established the caliphate is the, an effort to uh, bring the apocalypse uh, pretty close. Uh, but the gamble on establishing the caliphate did not work as well as the Islamic State uh, was hoping. The fact that uh, Al-Qaeda, despite facing, uh, this was a big hit to Al-Qaeda, uh, not only losing its uh, strongest franchise, the Islamic State of Iraq, but actually seeing that franchise surpassing it and attracting lots of new people. But despite that, Al-Qaeda managed to uh, survive and it's doing pretty well comparatively to uh, where they were before and definitely in, if you take into account again the, uh, the difficulties that it faced with the rise of the uh, Islamic State. So lots of uh, other small groups just refused to join the Islamic State. Yes, we hear a lot about the expansion and there were lots of people that did uh, find themselves attracted to the message or many times more important, attracted to the resources that the Islamic State has to uh, provide buying allegiance of uh, different groups. Uh, and of course, nothing is more attractive than success. Uh, but overall, it created a backlash among the jihadi community uh, because there were lots of uh, uh, jihadis that saw the efforts of the Islamic State as an attempt to uh, force their hands to push them in a direction that they refuse, uh, and they saw the caliphate rather than an attempt to really unite the Muslim Ummah, the Muslim community, uh, they saw that instead as an effort that uh, causes divisions. 
But as I said, in reality, the appeal depends to a large extent on the resources that are now becoming increasingly scarce, and that's causing significant problems for the Islamic State. And that's where the, my argument about the economic plan or the lack thereof uh, comes. When you go on a state building project, you need to actually grow an economy. Different states have different uh, systems to do that, but the idea is still to create economic growth. But the Islamic State didn't really have any viable economic plan. Uh, their idea of uh, the economy was that uh, we expand. First of all, you have the expansion taking Mosul and the areas around. And uh, the Islamic State was immediately went for the resources, and that meant uh, taking the resources or the property of the minorities. Uh, some that the Islamic State just uh, killed and took their resources, others that the Islamic State uh, scared away uh, and took their resources. But the problem with that kind of uh, income is that once those people are gone, that resource, it's not, you can't really replenish that resource. In order to actually grow, you need a real economy. But at a certain point, the Islamic State was even speaking in a negative way about uh, um, agriculture. It was really interesting in one of the, uh, its magazines. Uh, it's not against uh, uh, agriculture, but it makes it very clear that people are expected, instead of focusing on that, people are expected to join the army of the caliphate because resources will come through uh, uh, looting, through the military expansion that will bring new resources. But that means that uh, you don't have any economic plan, and in order to survive, you depend on constantly expanding. But the Islamic State got too many enemies too fast and could not really expand in the same way to provide the resources that it needed. When the Islamic State has less resources, it's also less appealing. And that creates significant uh, difficulties for the Islamic State. But let me finish with some uh, more, I'd say, uh, less positive uh, remarks about what's happening next. Because even though the Islamic State is weakening, uh, the threat is far from over, and uh, I agree with the call. This is a threat that's going to be with us for a long, long time. So first, the Islamic State, uh, as it tried the state-building project, moved to a conventional army, using uh, sometimes uh, uh, terrorist tactics, but it was mostly relying on uh, large military formations. Uh, but as you lose territory, the Islamic State is expected. We're already seeing uh, evidence that the Islamic State is moving uh, back towards uh, guerrilla tactics and uh, in the West especially relying a lot more on terrorism. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a real issue, especially the terrorism in the West, because we can expect that uh, even though the Islamic State is going to is suffering defeats in the Middle East and going to continue to suffer defeats, uh, the threat at the same time could actually increase in the West. The Islamic State sent uh, enough people back to Europe. It's much more difficult to send people back to the US. It was difficult in the beginning for people in the United States to actually head towards Syria and Iraq. So this is one source of threat, uh, returnees. Interestingly, that seems to be much more significant at this point in Europe. Uh, Cole and I had a conversation before. Uh, we try to see if we can actually remember cases of lone wolves in Europe. And it seemed like there are less lone wolves in Europe and much more focus on returnees from uh, Syria and Iraq with more direct connection to the Islamic State. In the United States, the main threat uh, is really lone wolves. And if 
the Islamic State is not the first one to speak about uh, lone wolves. Uh, Al-Qaeda also tried to encourage, but Al-Qaeda saw that uh, it actually caused it, uh, caused it damage. Uh, since uh, it's really hard to say that, but Al-Qaeda is more moderate than uh, the Islamic State and actually cares about uh, public opinion. So for uh, Al-Qaeda, they were afraid that if you let individuals loose, they might hit the wrong targets and they can undermine the image of Al-Qaeda. They saw that happening before and they became a lot more cautious about it. But from the perspective of the Islamic State, basically they give a blank check to anybody that wants to target any kind of target in the West. Uh, nobody is immune. And that means that it's really easy for them to just embrace anybody that takes any kind of action, no matter what's the, the reason. So this is still something that's gonna accompany us for a, a while. Second problem is that the uh, story is not over in Iraq and Syria. Uh, true, we need to think a little bit about what's happening next, but I think that I'm seeing too many articles these days about what comes after the Islamic State. The Islamic State is not, uh, this is not over in Iraq and Syria. Uh, Fallujah is not even over yet, uh, despite the uh, Iraqi claims. And Raqqa and uh, Mosul are gonna be a completely different kind of story, and it's gonna be very hard to dislodge the Islamic State from uh, these locations. But even when that happens, it's really important what's gonna happen in those cities afterwards. And at this point, we see that the main forces that are heading towards those uh, uh, cities are Kurds and Shia, not Sunnis. But those cities are primarily Sunni, uh, and uh, there is a real risk of what's gonna happen when Sunni population is gonna meet uh, the Kurdish forces and the Shia forces, uh, evidence from the actions of the militias in Iraq uh, outside of Fallujah in the last few weeks are pretty bad omen to what might happen uh, if the Islamic State is dislodged from uh, uh, Raqqa and Mosul. That means that Sunni grievances are gonna be there for a long time. That means that imposing order or getting some kind of order in those cities is gonna be a real problem. You might have at the beginning, but very quickly there will be an insurgency uh, that will go and uh, rebel against uh, the uh, foreign forces. Because when we think about foreign, we again, we think in terms of nationalities. But in a sectarian conflict that, or at least the way that it emerged to become, developed to become a uh, sectarian conflict, the Kurds and the Shia are foreigners for the Sunni in uh, those cities. So that's gonna be a, a, a real problem, and unless you come up with a solution that gives Sunnis a stake or provides Sunnis incentives, uh, it's gonna be very hard to find a solution to those cities. So far, we see that the United States is focusing on the military aspect of the Battle, I don't see any signs that the US is really serious about creating a Sunni uh, alternative, uh, somebody that can actually manage those, uh, uh, those cities and somebody that can have a stake in the management, not just of those cities, but of the, uh, Iraq and Syria. So that's gonna create problems and Sunni grievances are gonna continue uh, and that's of course gonna create conditions for the continuation of terrorism. And even in the un, unexpected occasion where uh, you could say that the Islamic State will be destroyed, I don't think that's gonna happen, there will be somebody else that will come in its stead. And uh, so it might not be exactly the Islamic State, but it's gonna be somebody that is in many ways uh, similar. And I would end with the argument that we need to accept that jihadi terrorism is uh, here for a long time because 
the Middle East is not going to become uh, an ordered place anytime soon. The Middle East is going undergoing transition. Uh, there will be unmet public expectations. Uh, it, it's going to, even in the best case where the Islamic State uh, get kicked out of uh, uh, Iraq and Syria, uh, the problems of the Middle Eastern countries uh, are going to make sure that there will be significant instability. And when you add that instant instability to uh, Sunni grievances and to the appeal of extreme ideologies that still there and gonna still be there for a while until an alternative will show itself as credible and that is able to provide uh, people's uh, aspirations, uh, this is not going to go away. Now, final thing is that you need to add to that that it's becoming increasingly easy to kill people. That means that the power to build is much lower than the power to destroy. It's much easier to be a spoiler, and you can have a real genuine effort to create uh, functioning states, uh, theoretically. Nobody is really interested in genuinely creating functioning states. Uh, but even if you would really try that, the ability of spoilers to uh, cause havoc in the region and undermine any kind of transition uh, is going to make sure that uh, jihadi terrorism is here to stay for a long, long time. Thank you. taping our, uh, uh, our program here this evening. And we'll start, uh, okay, we'll start right there and then we'll go over here. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, what's your take on the role of Turkey uh, with relation to the Islamic State? Well, Turkey's had, is this, can everybody hear me? Yeah, good. Turkey's had a, a mixed relationship with, with the Islamic State and the jihadi groups because for a long time it had a rather uh, open door policy with regard to letting uh, jihadis go into northern Syria uh, in large measure because it had Turkey uh, bore quite a grudge against the Assad regime. Uh, but th the main problem today is uh, Turkey has, has clamped down a lot. Uh, it's not perfect, but it has clamped down a lot. The main problem is that Turkey is much more concerned with um, Kurdish separatism in, in uh, northeastern Syria and northwestern Iraq and the spillover effects going into Turkey. And so it's hard to get Turkey completely on board with a counter uh, Islamic State or counter, counter ISIL, if government speak, uh, strategy because what it is really concerned with is not the jihadi threat so much as the, the domestic uh, Kurdish threat. Uh, I agree with that. I'll just uh, add one point. Uh, I think what we're seeing with Turkey, uh, it's a phenomenon that I call riding the back of the tiger, and uh, it seems quite common among uh, states that gamble on supporting actors that uh, end up harming them. I think that at this point there is some kind of, uh, uh, the Islamic State penetrated Turkey pretty well. Uh, to the point that uh, every time that the Turkey wants to take action against the Islamic State, it needs to take into account what might be the implication in terms of the ability of the Islamic State to actually harm Turkey. So in some ways, there is some uh, deterrence between Turkey and the uh, Islamic State. Doesn't mean that Turkey won't take uh, additional action uh, if situation requires, but it means that it has good reasons to be hesitant. Okay, we had a question right here. Yep. So, uh, good evening, gentlemen. Uh, you talked a little bit about, you know, the contraction of ISIS in Iraq and Syria, yet in the news there's often this perceived threat of their expansion, and rarely does Libya 
you know, come up in the conversation, although there's been reports of 5,000 to 8,000 so-called ISIS fighters in Libya. Can you, can you explain your take on Libya and whether that's truly an example of potential expansion or, or what that may be otherwise? Uh, Libya is actually these days going pretty well for the anti-Islamic State coalition. Uh, the, there is a new unity government in Libya. I'm not sure how long it can actually hold, but for a while now, uh, there is a the forces that are really clamping down on the beachhead of the Islamic State in Libya, and uh, they managed to take lots of territory from the Islamic State. And more important, they managed to uh, practically blockade the Islamic State. Uh, its uh, forces are focused in the city of Sirt, uh, and uh, that has access to the sea. But uh, there are now uh, NATO forces uh, uh, that are blocking the ability of the Islamic State and uh, its people to actually get out of the area or to threaten Europe. It doesn't mean that uh, that threat is over. Uh, you, know, you, you manage to stop it in one location and people will transit from uh, another location. Uh, but to a large extent, uh, we see that in Syria, uh, the Islamic State is losing uh, people, it's losing uh, uh, its ability to um, operate, and uh, there is a good chance that soon we're going to see almost everybody there melting away and uh, trying to find a different location in, in Libya. Now, because the situation in Libya is so complicated for other reasons, because of the civil war in, in Libya, uh, I won't be surprised if the Islamic State will be able to emerge in a different location uh, in Libya. It, before Syria, it, it was in a different city, uh, but was able to, but was kicked out of that city. Uh, so uh, the Islamic State will continue to uh, try to pop up in different locations because they need to extend the battlefield. It makes perfect sense for them uh, to try to have uh, new locations so that it can uh, open new fronts, or at least that uh, those new fronts will force its enemies to uh, split their resources. I think you, you raise a very important uh, issue, which is how do, how do we really measure contraction and expansion of, of this organization? John McCain recently said that it's unwise to think that we're actually beating the Islamic State because most of the territory that we've wrested from them is really just desert. And to a large extent, that's true. I think that it, it's very easy to exaggerate the gains in terms of territory because really all that really matters is, is cities and their arteries connecting them. When it comes to, to Libya, most of what has been retaken from the Islamic State around Sirte is, is coastline. We haven't seen a, a great deal of, of the city being taken from them. So um, I think that you know, Libya is a very chaotic place. Uh, there was recently a, a video that came out of the Islamic State's uh, Libya franchise, uh, a video calling on uh, West uh, su Sub-Saharan Africans to emigrate and come to Libya. So I don't think that, that Libya is going to be kind of uh, the great beachhead of a new uh, expansionary process for the Islamic State in Africa, but I don't think that it's, it's a problem that's going to go away because of, of the chaos. Uh, there's one gentleman right here who had his hand up almost first, right there, and then this gentleman in the back corner, and then we're going to come over here. Uh, gentlemen, I too thank you for a beautiful presentation. Um, I'm curious about one thing, and that is the the term uh, that we've been referring to all night long has been ISIS, and I hear that term used uh, most prominently almost everywhere, but I sometimes hear the organization referred to as ISIL. What is the what is somebody trying to convey when when they so adamantly use uh, that term? You know what I'm referring to. 
Yeah, so, <laughs> I mean, these aren't, uh, when I go to conferences in Washington, you usually find that if, if I'm on one side of the table and I'm, I use the word ISIS or the Islamic State and the people from the State Department or, or other parts of the government will use the term ISIL. And you know, there's, uh, there's no problem in communication, but there is just for some reason a, uh, a tendency for the government to stick with ISIL. But essentially they mean the same thing, which is the Islamic State of Iraq and in the case of ISIS, Sham, which means greater Syria in Arabic. And uh, in the case of ISIL, the Islamic State of Iraq and the Le Levant, which is the French word for pretty much the same thing. I think that the word Shem is actually uh, technically more accurate, but um, the point is moot because uh, beginning in June 2014, the Islamic State stopped using the phrase in Iraq and Sham or in Iraq and the Levant to describe itself. It said, we're going to be the Islamic State full stop because we can control territory everywhere. We have a territorial claim that is universal. So their official name is just the Islamic State or the Caliphate, sometimes the state of the Caliphate. But you'll find that the government just doesn't want to, to change. And I don't think that it's that big of a deal, but it, it does, um, I think, it is worth remembering that the, the group conceives of itself as having universal um, you know, aspirations in terms of territory. I have an anecdote uh, about this. Uh, I got an email a couple of years ago uh, from uh, David Albright. Uh, he's the uh, president of uh, Think Tank in Washington uh, using the same acronym, ISIS. Uh, I don't remember what exactly that stands for. I'm sure that there is some International Se Institute and International Security, but there is an S that I missed. Uh, and in that email, uh, they emailed me and some other people that uh, uh, write uh, sometimes to Washington audience. Uh, he tried to make the argument why I should use ISIL rather than ISIS, uh, and really also explaining that this hurts them. Uh, they were not the only victims of the use of uh, ISIS. Uh, if anybody here watches the show Archer, uh, it's an animated show about a spy. Uh, the intelligence agency that they used was called ISIS. After ISIS started pushing in Iraq and Syria, they had to eliminate that name. There was also a perfume that was launched just about a month before the Islamic State uh, conquered uh, Mosul, and that perfume was called ISIS. Not a good name to have. With ISIL, you don't have that kind of problem. It just doesn't sound right. But, okay, but both here. are anachronisms. It is IS. It's just a lot. I think it's more fun to say ISIS. <laughs> it's catchier. Yeah, you can't do IS is. It's just complicated to write. IS, IS. Yeah. And a question back here. I appreciate the levity uh, and, and your insights on the Middle East. Uh, but uh, we've ha heard a question about Turkey and then about uh, Libya. But what about Iran? And how does, how does Iran come into this picture? And if you would, relate it to the, the Kurdish situation, where it seems like uh, the Kurdish separatists, I think you referred to them, are like terrorists to Turkey, but they seem to have good relationships with Iran and the, the different Kurdish parties. Does that, does that play into this situation? I can't speak too much to the, the Kurdish-Iranian uh, relationship, but I can say something about Iran and the Islamic State. And the, the first thing to, to understand is that the Islamic State tends to think of Iran and the fact that it is a Shia state, it is a majority Shia, 90% Shia Muslim state, uh, that this is the greatest enemy of the Islamic State in the Middle East, much more so than the United States. This is a near, uh, it, this is a neighbor, and this is a group that is hegemonic. This is the way that it is perceived. This is also the way that it's perceived in the larger in the broader Sunni community stretching from Lebanon, Jordan, Syria, Iraq, 
uh, to Saudi Arabia. And you'll find that the, this features the most prominently in the Islamic State's propaganda, the idea that Iran is trying to kind of let out its tentacles and take over parts of Syria and Iraq. It sees that it's already done this in Lebanon with Hezbollah. So we tend to, to, to look at the region in, through the prism of either the Arab-Israeli conflict or, or, or the, the legacy of imperialism and hatred of the West. But when you look at the, the propaganda before the United States started bombing the Islamic State in 2014, it's almost all focused on Iran and Iran as, as the great threat. Here. Thank you, gentlemen, for your comments. Very interesting. Um, I would like to go to the core of the issue that we aren't discussing. To prosecute a war requires finances. What is the source of economic power within the country? They don't have any arms factory. They don't have chemical factories that are producing weapons. Where is the money coming from? And we have done a fairly decent job at destroying their refineries and interdicting their pipeline systems, including their transportation. Where's the money coming from? Uh, I think that the, you're right, oil is a significant uh, source of income, but the US is doing a good job now reducing it. Uh, it's not just the uh, refineries, but uh, recently the Russians started bombing the, the oil, tri oil trucks, uh, and the US then started following. Uh, and beyond destroying uh, those trucks, it also creates more difficulties uh, for trucks that are not bombed. Uh, they need to take into account the possibility that they will be bombed. Uh, so in general, the resources from oil are declining significantly. Other sources of uh, funding for the Islamic State, are, well, the main one is actually taxing its own population. The problem with that is that in order to tax the population, they need to actually have money. Uh, and you can try to do different kinds of um, manipulations with the local currency and dollars, but that doesn't create enough revenue. You need taxing the people. In the past, at least until uh, about a year ago, the Iraqi government continued to, play, to pay uh, its employees in Mosul the salaries. So the Iraqi government in Baghdad uh, gave money to, the, to Mosul that the Islamic State was able to then tax. But since then, uh, Iraq stopped it, and now the Islamic State has a lot less to tax. That means that even though the Islamic State still has a significant uh, amount of money, it's definitely not enough to sustain uh, state building and uh, military effort. Now, as the Islamic State will contract, its financial needs are going to decline as well. So we need to keep uh, that in mind. The, the financial crunch is definitely still going to be significant, but the, the situation is pretty fluid. You lose territory, you also don't need to provide, or you lose cities, you don't need to provide services in those cities. You described a hatred that Saudi Arabia has for some aspects of re religion. So I'm concerned and would like to hear more about what your take is on the investment that Saudi Arabia is pouring into the United States and funding mosques and so forth. Uh, and how that might, not just short term, but long term. Right. So. Um, Saudi Arabia subscribes to the uh, movement in Islam called Salafism, used to be called more often uh, Wahhabism. According to the Saudis, this is just a pure, normal uh, Sunni Islam. It is a particularly intolerant form of Islam, and it is one that the country uh, is, uh, does export with lots of, uh, with lots of money. Um, the issue is that a lot of, a lot of people, particularly uh, newspapers, I think, um, they, they editorialize about this, try to um, 
I think, exaggerate the relationship between terrorism and, and Salafi uh, propagation, as it were. And the issue is that if you look at most of the places, including the United States, where Saudi Arabia has given money um, and tried to export its ideology, it hasn't led to terrorism. It's led to this very intolerant form of Islam becoming more popular, um, but it's actually unclear to what degree it's, uh, it's becoming more popular because of these, these efforts of propagation versus the fact that this is just a very, very potent ideology that has been spreading even before um, and sometimes in some cases uh, in, in spite of the fact that it's related to the Saudis. So it, while there, there's a very strong relationship between uh, Salafism and, and terrorism, I think it, you should see it in terms of more that Salafism can be, can be weaponized uh, by people uh, who want to make it a, a kind of effort, uh, to, to make it an ideology of, of jihad, but it isn't uh, inevitably that. It's basic, um, the basic idea behind Salafism is intolerance, and we all know that people who are intolerant can be perfectly uh, quietist. I, something is somewhat related to that. It's now, uh, there is an interesting shift now in the US from uh, uh, focusing on seeing Iran as the enemy to now seeing Saudi Arabia uh, as the enemy. Uh, and, I, and I hate to be in a position of actually defending Saudi Arabia. This is not a place that I would want and live in, uh, even if I was less Jewish. Uh, <laughs> but ooh, one of the, the arguments that we often hear is about how uh, the Gulf countries are funding uh, the Islamic State. Now, the Islamic State, actually, most of its uh, uh, funding, um, it's self-financing, uh, primarily. Uh, but there is something that I, I, I like to emphasize when we speak about uh, terrorism financing. Uh, it might sound strange for you, but I would argue that European countries are actually funding terrorism a lot more than the Gulf countries. And how do they do that? by paying ransoms. Uh, so the Islamic State gets, uh, on average, uh, dozens of millions of dollars every year uh, through ransom payments. According to uh, the Security Council resolutions, this still should uh, fall under uh, terrorism financing, but European countries for political reasons, somehow, this never gets uh, highlighted. Instead, it's very comfortable to look at the few donors in the Gulf that are still providing money for uh, terrorism. I'm not saying that uh, there shouldn't be attention to those uh, donors, and the countries of the Gulf uh, are really trying hard because they have their own interests. They're not doing that as a favor to the U.S. or because of fear of the US, but they do that because they identify that some of that threat is going to get back to them. But we completely ignore the fact that uh, those kind of actors get so much money just from ransoms that European countries are paying. Question right here. Thank you. And, um, the fabric does seem to be tearing even between uh, Bahrain and Iran. I have a simple question for you. How is Jordan managing to stay out of all of this? If you look at the news, at least yesterday it didn't seem that they were doing uh, so well. There was an attack yesterday uh, and Jordanian soldiers uh, were killed. One of the first things that the United States did after the uh, Islamic State uh, managed to get uh, Mosul was to send a small number of forces to Jordan to help assure that the border between Iraq and Jordan, especially the border crossings, uh, that they are supervised, uh, that they can uh, that Jordan is relatively safe from the uh, threat of the Islamic State. And Jordan has 
pretty good uh, uh, security services uh, and they're working really well with the United States and they have great cooperation with the uh, Israeli intelligence. But at the same time, we need to remember that uh, um, over a million, uh, it's over a million refugees, uh, Syrian refugees now in, uh, in Jordan. I think that the, uh, the refugee camp, uh, well, the Jordanian population uh, got an addition of about 20% just refugees from, uh, uh, from Syria. Um, so even in the best case, uh, you can easily assume uh, infiltration. The fact that so far we hardly seen anything in Jordan suggests that actually the Islamic State is weaker in Jordan. Uh, I think that uh, uh, Salafis and perhaps Al Qaeda are stronger in uh, Jordan than the Islamic State. The Islamic State will try to make some inroads uh, into Jordan but Jordan is doing relatively well. Having said that, the situation in the Middle East is always fluid, uh, and sometimes it's enough that uh, some plots uh, somehow manage to go through the cracks, and it creates a new, uh, uh, completely new kind of, uh, of environment. But so far, Jordan is doing well, and the United States is really careful to make sure that uh, nothing happens to Jordan. The United States understand how important Jordan is as an ally. And so uh, this is one of those cases where actually a U.S. ally, a genuine U.S. ally that gets treated as such. I also wouldn't uh, discount the experience that Jordanians went through when they watched the video of their fighter pilot being burned alive in a cage. Um, this was not a good way to win popular support in Jordan. Like I said before, ISIS is not interested, as it says, in winning popular support. And the only other thing I, I would mention is that Jordan has a relatively cynical relationship with its, its jihadis. I think that Jordan might have one of the biggest populations of, of people who are very sympathetic to the jihadi Salafi movement. And the, what they've done is try to kind of contain this movement and keep it uh, allied with Al Qaeda. And so they've actually released a few of the noteworthy uh, ideologues or scholars from prison, and they write on a daily basis, and they're on Twitter um, in favor of Al Qaeda and against the Islamic State. So I think that Jordan, you know, they won't tell this, uh, tell our embassy that, but that's, you know, they're they're up to that as well. By the way, there are about two, three thousand Jordanian uh, um, volunteers, foreign fighters, uh, that joined the Islamic State in primarily in Syria. So we're going to call it there to keep our promise to uh, adjourn at 9 o'clock. If some of you have uh, further questions you want to ask our panelists, I'm sure they'll stick around for a little while to entertain those. Uh, I want to uh, thank both of our very distinguished and well-informed uh, panelists. Please uh, give them a round of applause. And our colleague, Michael Noonan, and our partner, uh, the Foreign Policy Research Institute of Philadelphia, fpri.org, is where you can find out more. Uh, both of these gentlemen are distinguished authors, as you heard. I can't recite the title of their books, uh, but uh, those uh, are, we don't have them here tonight, but they are certainly available, and we commend them uh, uh, to you. Uh, two real quick notes. So first of all, the next uh, National Defense Forum in our series is on July 29th, but on July 6th, we'll have our traditional date with history on the first Wednesday of every month. Uh, that will be John McManus, who has spoken here before. He'll be speaking on his most recent book, uh, Hell Before Their Eyes, uh, The Allied Liberation of uh, Dachau and uh, the Concentration Camps in Germany in 1945. Uh, he's, a, he's a great author, so I encourage you to put those two dates on your uh, calendar uh, and come back and see us on July 6th and July 29th. With regard to this subject, I hope that, that you know, there's a million other questions we could ask these guys uh, and probably many that we can't think of that they would be able to answer. But the takeaway I have is that this situation of American interests and threats thereto 
in the Middle East is really fragile and really complicated and really difficult and defies simple solutions. And so uh, I, I, that, that's the point that I would make. Is there a tie to the 1st Infantry Division? You bet there is. Today, 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 several hundred GIs of the 1st Infantry Division are flowing back into Fort Riley, Kansas at the conclusion of a nine-month tour where they were forward based in Kuwait. And while they were there, they were conducting combat operations in Iraq against IS and in support of the Iraqi uh, uh, security forces. Most of their military assistance work was in Jordan, where they were conducting exercises and training to bolster the capability of the Jordanian armed forces and the Jordanian uh, uh, border guards. And they were also doing uh, military assistance and training all over the uh, Middle East and South Asia with those countries that are friendly to the United States uh, and basically in support uh, of American policy in the Middle East. There, there are no easy solutions to any of this. I wouldn't say for a minute that our policy or our strategy is good, bad, or indifferent. I have my own personal opinions. You need to make up your mind. But our soldiers don't make policy. They go where we ask them to go. They take the risks on our behalf to the point of their very lives, and they do what the President of the United States, duly elected, and the officers appointed over them ask them to do. And so whenever you see one of our GIs, one of our service members of any service, please remember to thank them for their service. Um, okay, so this is an outstanding program. Thank both of you again. Thank you all for coming, and we'll see you on July 6th. Have a safe trip home.